clearly do I remember, even it's over 50 years ago, a time of my, my backsliding after I knew Jesus. It's what the old timers call it, a backslidden. Probably they were the most miserable 18 months of my life. I blamed God and I blamed other Christians for my sin and failure. And that made things worse. (laughs) I tried to run away from God and other Christian believers as far as I could. But what happened that deepened my loneliness of sin big time? Oh, I did everything possible to resist and reject any advances that the family of God were making toward me. But the loneliness of sin and disobedience is only one of many other types of loneliness that the Bible talks about. And that I have faced after that one. And that is why today, And the next two messages, there will be three messages altogether, we started the series on loneliness and the cure for loneliness in the last message. But today and the next two messages, I will be delineating the six different types of loneliness the Bible talks about. And we're going to see two at a time. But for your own record, let me give you all the six right now. There is is the loneliness of sin. There is a loneliness of suffering. There is a loneliness of service, yes? <laughs> there is a loneliness of so there's a loneliness of self-pity. The loneliness of sorrow and the loneliness of stubbornness. Now, we're going to look at the first two today. We're going to look at the loneliness of sin in the life of Cain. And then we're going to look at the loneliness of suffering in the life of Job. I think even non-believers know that Cain killed Abel. It's a kind of well-known story in a sense. But what most people do not know is that Cain killed Cain. He did. Albeit a slow death, albeit through the loneliness of sin that resulted from his refusal to confess his sin and repent of his sin and ask forgiveness for his sin. Oh, to be sure, Cain's death was spiritual, not physical. Well, let me tell you, sometimes the slow spiritual death can be far more painful than the physical death. Oh, my friends, listen. God, in his wisdom, made life to be lived in fellowship. In fellowship. First and foremost, in fellowship with God the Father through Jesus, who made it possible for us to have intimacy with the Father in fellowshipping with Him, then fellowship with the family, and certainly the fellowship with the family of of God. But sadly, as it was my experience in those early years, that because of unconfessed sin, we shut God out, and we shut the family of God out of our lives. And that causes us even deeper inner pain and inner loneliness. Turn to to Genesis 4. Now, if you don't have your Bible, just grab one from the pocket in front of you. There's some pews, Bible, just grab one. And Genesis 4 is very easy, really. Only turn two pages, okay? And you get into four. Here you're going to see the loneliness of unconfessed sin, and you're going to see it very clearly. In Genesis 4, we see Cain's sin, but that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story. But his refusal to confess his sin to God, his refusal to ask God to forgive him for his sin is what made him a wanderer and a fugitive. The Bible tells us that both brothers, Cain and Abel, the first two sons of Adam and Eve, 
they both came and offered sacrifices to God. You say, well, so far so good, right? Yes. <laughs> but Abel came to God God's way. Cain wanted to come to God his own way, not God's way. Abel brought the sacrifice of faith. Cain wanted to offer the sacrifice of good works, and it backfired. Naturally, God accepted Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's. You know, let me stop right here. <laughs> Just to, to tell you, from ever since that time in creation, ever since that time, for all these thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the world has been made only of two kinds of people. Trust me. Two kinds of people. We're talking about racism and all this stuff. There's only one race, and that's the human race. But there are two kinds of people. Those who come to God God's way, and those who want to come to God their own way. This is it. There's no third. Uh, and that is why in the epistle of Jude, Jude was half-brother of Jesus, and he wrote an epistle. It's only one chapter. In verse 11 of that chapter, he calls this wanting to come to God, God their own way, not God's way, uh, not as God revealed himself, but what they think God ought to uh, accept him, and uh, God ought to do this, or God ought to do the other thing. He calls that, he calls it the way of Cain. Let me explain this. When Adam and Eve went against the will of God, when God said, don't do this, they did it. God brought a, a lamb, a slaughtered an innocent lamb, shed the blood of an innocent lamb in order to redeem their sin. You see, from the beginning, from the very beginning, God was teaching humanity that in thousands of years' time, God himself is going to shed the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross to redeem repentant sinners. That was God's desire from the very beginning, that God's plan from the very beginning. It's not that God had plan A, didn't work out, he went to plan B. No, 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 he had only one plan. And here it is. Abel got the message. Abel understood what God wanted, an animal sacrifice, and he brought them to God. Cain said, in effect, I don't care what God said. I don't care what my parents said. <laughs> I will give God and come to God how I think I should come to God. And he has no choice but to accept me, right? He brought some produce of the land. Listen to me, I've said this very often. It could be more expensive than the lamb. It could be, cost a lot more money. But that's not the issue. The issue is not money and it's not amount, it's obedience. One came to God God's way and the other one wanted to come to God his own way. And when God rejected Cain's sacrifice, he became angry. <laughs> he became angry. And so Genesis 4, 6, 7, and 8, God asks, a, 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 asks Cain, why are you angry? <laughs> That's a reasonable, reasonable question. Isn't it? Why are you angry? Why are your faces downcast? If you do what is right, listen to this very carefully. This is to every one of us. If you do what is right, Will you not be accepted? Absolutely. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching. It's an image of a lion sitting outside the door waiting for a prey. His sin is crouching at your door. It's desire to have you, but you must master it. And Cain said, oh, Lord, help me to master sin. No, 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 no. Sadly, Cain... In anger, instead of repenting of his sin and asking God for his forgiveness, he went out in a fit of anger and a fit of envy and a fit of jealousy, and he killed his brother Abel. Genesis 4, 8. 
God asked Cain again. I love it when God asks questions, don't you? I, just, I chuckle when I, I see that in the scripture because God knows, right? He knows. He, knows, he, he loves to ask questions. Adam, where are you? God can know where Adam hiding. <laughs> he wants to give him a chance to come out and say, Lord, forgive me, I've sinned. Yes. And when God calls you, he's not calling you to condemn you. He's calling you to repent. So he asked Cain, where is your brother? <laughs> Beloved, this is God's way of giving us and giving Cain at that time an opportunity. Yet another opportunity. Yet another chance to confess and repent of his sin. But again, Cain, he lies to God. <laughs> Just think about this. He's lying to God. The one who sees all things, knows all things, is lying to him. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know if you can see the humor. That's okay. That's all right. I, I'm, I'm just a weird person. <laughs> what is God said, verse 13, Genesis 4, 13. You will be a wrestler, a restless wanderer on the earth. <laughs> what did Cain say? I want you to really focus on this one because it's really another humorous thing in the Bible. My punishment is more than I can bear. <laughs> you notice he didn't say, my sin is more than I can bear. You could never sin beyond the mercy of God. Listen to me. If he says, my sin is more than I can bear. But no, he said, my punishment is more than I can bear. He was worried about the punishment, not about the sin. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So God, in his mercy, put some sort of a mark on Cain so nobody would kill him. Slow death is far worse than sudden death. Look at verse 16 with me. Beloved, this is when the loneliness of sin really sits in. Then Cain went out of the Lord's presence. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Might never be. I always tell the Lord this. I said, not even for a nanosecond. I don't want to be out of your presence, out of your covering, out of your umbrella, out of your shadow. Remember the last message when we started the series on the cure for loneliness? I quoted one of the greats of yesteryear when he said, loneliness is the malnutrition of the soul. <laughs> it's malnutrition. And when you're spiritually malnourished, you're going to go for the fake. You're going to go for the false substitute. You're going to look for the lookalike stuff, not the real thing. And so what did Cain do? The Bible said he went out and built a city. <laughs> he went out and built a city. Now, if you read my book, Divine Discontent, which I read many years ago, but I, I talk about the city of man that Cain built. Because our city of God, city of man, all that I learned from St. Augustine, nothing original with me. I have no original thought. I only tell you what the Word says and what others said. <laughs> now, most of you know that often some of those who grow up in a small town, my goodness, I met some of them. I mean, just can't wait to go into the big city. Oh, they want to go to the Big Apple. They want to go to the big city. So can get mugged, I guess. Uh, it's okay. You'll get that tomorrow morning. In the big city, they think this is where they can bury the loneliness of sin. Uh, they think this there, they're going to find an un anonymity. They're going to find entertainment to keep them busy and occupied. Their way of trying to hide from God. Although, also they think, <laughs> beloved, listen to me. The pain of the loneliness of sin will persist no matter where you go. It will persist until it's confessed and repented of and receive a new life from Christ. 
Listen to me. All of the misery that begins by wanting to come to God your own way, by wanting to come to God, uh, believe in God the way I want to believe in God, not what the Word, the word of God tells me about God. <laughs> All that is just the beginning. It's the beginning. And then it gets worse. It gets worse. It never gets better. It gets worse. It doesn't stop there. It, followed by hatred in the case of Cain. And then murder. Inevitably, it's going to lead to greater sin and greater sin. Hear me right, please. I'm talking to believers in the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Every believer, I want to tell you, I want, I want you to listen carefully. Having hatred in your heart toward a brother or a sister in Christ will cause severe loneliness of sin. The Apostle John in his epistle, first epistle, chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, he said the following. Listen carefully. This is how we know who are the children of God and who are the children of the evil one. Anyone who does not love his brother or sister is not a child of God. Then he continues. He says, this message that you heard from the beginning, you should love one another. And then he goes on to say, do not be like Cain. Don't be like Cain. Brethren, I, I, through the years, and I shared this testimony probably, I don't know if I did or didn't now that I have an excuse for being, having senior moments, uh, but I could never minister. I could never minister individually or standing here in the pulpit if I'm carrying a grudge in my heart towards somebody. Listen to me. You cannot be used of God mightily if you're carrying a grudge. And I pray to God that everyone at the sound of my voice, not only just here in this beautiful sanctuary, but the millions of people watching around the world through Kingdom Set and other, other venues, I want you to listen very carefully, please. If you are carrying a grudge in your heart toward a brother or a sister in Christ, give it to God now. Amen. Surrender it today. When you don't forgive your brother or sister for their failure, you know what you're saying? You say, I'm better than they are. I'm better than they are. <laughs> Listen to me. If a holy God yes. forgave us sinners, who are we? Who are we? Mortal sinners not forgive one another. See, when Cain shut God out of his life, when Cain shut his brother out of his life, then it's inevitably... Cain shut himself out of his own life. Are you with me? Amen. And he plunged into the loneliness of despair. Oh, beloved, if you shut God out, if you shut his grace out, as I did for a time, then inevitably, inevitably, inevitably the world becomes a prison of loneliness. No matter where you run, you will not find contentment. Why? Because by shutting God out of your life, by shutting the grace of God out of your life, by shutting brothers and sisters in Christ out of your life, you're acting like Cain. And as he said, now I'm a wonder. I'm lonely. I'm the, my experience is the worst kind of loneliness. What did he try to do? He tried to solve his own problem. <laughs> Instead of going to God, he was trying to conquer loneliness by building a city, finding some substitute to coming to God. He had been a farmer. <laughs> now he's going to be a city builder with technology. It's right there in the Scripture, technology, be it primitive technology or technology, nonetheless. Listen to me. All of the technology in the world will not cure your deep loneliness. It'll make it worse. 
David Henry Thoreau defined the city as a place where hundreds of people are lonely together. <laughs> the other day I read something that really was impactful. It says the average man lives a life of quiet desperation. Beloved, that should not be. That should not be. It doesn't have to be this way. God has provided only one way, only one way, only one way, only one way, but it cost him the blood of his son on the cross. So much for the loneliness of sin. Now I come quickly to the loneliness of suffering. Now switch over to Job 19. I'm going to stay with that. Job 90, I'm, going to, I'm not going to ask you to flip any more pages. Now, my colleague uh, who was typing my notes gave me the page in the Pew Bible, page 810. 810, if you have difficulty. But if you have your Bible, please underline what I'm going to be telling you. This is… But you know what? I'm going to confess something to you. <laughs> Richard knows this, my, my colleague, brother here. <laughs> you know, we've been reading the Bible. Many of you are doing this. The Daily Chronological Bible. For, and I've been doing this almost 30 years. It's quite… Almost 30 years. Go through the Bible every year. <laughs> when I come to the book of Job, which is right now, my goodness, I groan. I really do. I don't know about you, but I, I'm being honest with you. I groan. I can't stand his friends. <laughs> I feel like I want to punch them. <laughs> but anyway, if you read Job, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. If you haven't read it, of course, you don't know what I'm talking about. I think most people, most people who know the Scripture, know the Word of God, would agree that other than the suffering of Jesus at the cross yes. on Holy Week, probably Job suffered the most, yes. with the exception of our Lord Jesus. One day, just in one day, he lost everything, everything. I mean, he lost his wealth, all of it. He lost his 10 children, all of them. And then he lost his health. And then, to top it all, he lost his wife because she said to him, curse God and commit suicide. Just die. Yet, yet, he never lost faith in God. Oh, he was disappointed and he asked why, and there's nothing wrong with asking why. In fact, in chapter 7, verse 16, he said, I despise my life. But Job knew a type of loneliness. Listen to me, please. Some of you will identify with it, some are not, but that's okay. He knew and experienced a type of loneliness that can ever be experienced during the time of severe suffering. Most of us will testify to the fact that when we physically suffer or when we emotionally suffer, we are prone to lose our perspective, right? We lose our perspective on, on life. I know, I've been there. Every small problem becomes a huge problem. Every more hill becomes a mountain. By the same token, every big thing in life becomes insignificant. At that time, our natural focus is where? On ourselves, right? We, soon, we see no way out of the suffering. No way out of that loneliness that comes from suffering. Now, add to that, top that with fear. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, you can be, if fear sits in, in addition to all that other stuff, then the result is a unique form of loneliness. Job 19, you got it? You have it in front of you? Keep it there. Because in that chapter, what Job does, <laughs> he basically describes himself in the descriptions that he gives of his condition. They're so vivid. Uh, they're so incredibly descriptive images. It's so real, you can feel, almost feel like you can touch it. And he applies that to himself in his severe loneliness of suffering. 
Let's look at these very quickly, very quickly. Verse 6, Job sees himself as an animal who's caught in the net, and the net was tightened, and there is no way of escape. <laughs> That's the first image. God wronged me, and he drew his net around me. I'm stuck in the net. I can't get out of it. I'm trapped. Oh, beloved, listen to me. I don't know about you, but in times of severe suffering, we cannot help but feel trapped, confined. In fact, before even knowing those words in the book of Job, I used those same words in 1968 when I felt so trapped and so trapped under socialist dictatorship when I was trying to escape from the country of my birth where every door I knocked on was slammed shut. Every door I knocked on, I was knocking on doors every day, every day, every day for a year and a half until God supernaturally intervened. If that does not strengthen your faith, I don't know what. But I also know that a lot of people feel trapped. Some are probably watching us in hospitals where they feel trapped. Rehab centers. Those who are living in isolation, they feel trapped and they're lonely. The second image Job gives himself is verse 7. He feels like an unfairly accused criminal standing in a court of law, no one to defend him, all by himself. Look at it with me, verse 7. Though I cry, I've been wronged, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. And he feels that there's no one to defend him, no one to say a good word on his behalf. If you've ever been falsely accused... And you cannot do a thing about it. Falsely accused. If you've been wronged unjustly, and you cannot do a thing about it, then you know that loneliness of Job and the loneliness he's talking about. No matter how many people try to comfort you, certainly if you've ever cried to the Lord, And all you get back is silence, as I have and many of you have before. (laughs) You understand what that means. As a matter of fact, I remember many years ago, I preached a sermon about the five lessons God wants to teach us when He's silent. (laughs) And the third image Job gives himself in this situation, verse 8, he feels like a traveler, and all of a sudden, he's facing a roadblock. Now, those of us who love in Atlanta, who live in Atlanta, uh, you probably have experienced something like this. You're on 75 or 85 or both of them, <laughs> and, you, and you're going to catch a, a plane, and there was an accident, and the road is shut. You're going nowhere. You're traveling one mile an hour, and you're crawling, and you're fuming, and you're steaming. It's a roadblock. You can't go. Every time you think the road is moving and then it comes to a standstill. That's the image here. I'm trying to make it just so you can see it. Job was moving forward in every aspect of his life. He was serving God. He was serving his family. He was serving his children. He was encouraging them to know God. He was offering sacrifices on their behalf. Then all of a sudden, he hits this roadblock. Parking lot, highway. (laughs) Can't go to the right. Can't go to the left. You can't reverse. You're surrounded by cars, right? (laughs) All of your future plans stopped got a heart attack, you got a cancer, you got broken body, you got financial reversal, 
Your life has been brought to a standstill and you're frustrated and you're lonely. This is how Job felt. He felt like a caged animal in a net. He felt like a falsely accused criminal in the court with no one to defend him. He felt like a traveler who's facing a roadblock. But then he also, verse 9, that's chapter 19 of Job, verse 9, he felt like a dethroned king, a king who has been dethroned. (laughs) He, referring to God, stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. (laughs) Now, for me as a person who grew up in the Middle East, we're so used to uh, uh, military coups, you know, just the kind of regular stuff. You know, dictators are powerful, so strong, and then a military coup just dethrone him. And not only just punish him, they kill him. <laughs> you understand when you get dethroned. Job was a great community leader. Job was a dignified man. Job had helped so many people. Job had served to the best of his ability and, and as, as best as he knows how. Now he's sitting on an ash heap with sores all over his body. When people looked at him, they hid their eyes. Or they looked the other way. You don't want to look at this. It's so disgusting. You want to see it. Don't want to see it. Beloved, that is truly an utter loneliness of suffering. That's the extreme. But there's more. In verse 10, he sees himself as a building that is being destroyed. And then the same verse sees himself as a tree that has been overturned. He says... He tears me down on every side until I'm gone. Same verse. He feels like an uprooted tree. Certainly some of us have seen big trees in this area. Yeah, maybe 25, 30 feet in diameter. <laughs> Roots toppled. It was like a building, a big building in society with honor and, 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 and like a, fru- a fruit-bearing tree that is blessing a lot of people. Now, he lost all hope. Now, please listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Please. Please. Loss of hope can lead you to devastating loneliness. If you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you must never lose hope. That is his promise. And that is the experience that so many people who have been walking with him for, with year, for, for years have experienced. I'm going to move very quickly so I don't get bogged down in this and not get to the good stuff. Let me tell you, I'm coming to the good stuff. I'm going to good stuff. Even the Presbyterians are going to be shouting (laughs) when I get to the good stuff. (laughs) Verses 11 and 12. He felt like an enemy, besieged by an enemy. And guess who that enemy is? God and his armies. Besieging him. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. This, this kind of fear is indescribable. In fact, Genesis 42 36, Jacob, Jacob have experienced so many losses. He lost Rachel. He lost, lost Joseph, or at least he thought so. And now they're taking Benjamin. You know what he said? He yelled out and said, Everything is against me. Yeah. It wasn't the case. Joseph is actually on the throne of Egypt. Things don't always look the way you think they look. Listen to me. But nonetheless, nonetheless, this indescribable form of loneliness of suffering is real. But praise God. Praise God is not the end. Praise God is not the full story. Praise God is not forever. Praise God that is not all of life. And so Job will cry in chapter 19, verse 21, have pity on me, friends, have pity, for the hand of God has struck me. 
This is, beloved, the cry of utter loneliness, of, of suffering. But thank God for His faithfulness. Thank God for His faithfulness. I tell people, I say, I'm so glad I lived long enough. I can testify to the faithfulness of God in the ups and downs of life, in the difficulties of life, in the joys of life. In every- God is faithful. Listen to me. I know many of us look at what is happening in our society, in our culture, in our day, and you share with me uh, we see, uh, where we see our government is working against us instead of working for us. They're harassing us instead of protecting us and instead of protecting our children. They are harming our children instead of uh, supporting parents to take care of their children. They want to take the, our children away from us instead of defending us as the Bible commands governments to do. They are deliberately leaving us vulnerable and, 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 and open to violence of criminals. Instead of watching out for the well-being, they are riching themselves that some presidents came to power with a couple of million dollars uh, after their name. They're now worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. They are feeding themselves, not the flock they're supposed to serve. But listen, I know, I know, many of us, many of us look at all of this and we feel helpless and we feel discouraged. I've been there and I know you have too. Sometimes I feel, and this is my personal view, not the churches, not anybody else. I'm not representing anybody. I'm just speaking for myself. Sometimes I feel that we are in an insane asylum, and now the inmates are in charge. Oh, but thank God, thank God, thank God for verses 25 and 26. If you have your Bible, you underline those until you, you make it you tear in the, in the paper. Just mark it in your Bible, 25 and 26 where he could rise up above the loneliness of suffering. And Job say, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. (laughs) Now listen to me, listen to me. Job was prophesying of the coming of Jesus hundreds of years before Christ. He was prophesying of the coming of the Redeemer and the coming Messiah and the coming Jesus. And therefore, listen to me, our faith ought to be stronger than Job's faith because he was seeing it in the future. We know it. It's taken place. It worked in us. We know we have a living Redeemer. We know we have a living Savior. We know we're having a resurrected Lord. And soon He will return to take to, to right what is wrong, to heal every disease, to alleviate every suffering, and to restore hope and redeem every loss. Yes. Listen to me. Listen to me. Your friends may forsake you. Your family might turn on you. Your dearest and nearest may ignore you. But Jesus is always there for you. He's always there for you. Hear me right, please. Job may have felt like a caged animal in a net. But Jesus sets us free. You have his word on it. It's in John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. He may, we, Job felt as he was a defenseless, falsely accused, standing in the court of law. There was no one to defend him. But Romans 8, 31 promises us, if God be for us, I pity those who are against us. It's a rough translation. It's not like it's in the Bible, but you get the meaning. Job may have felt like a traveler who's been facing a roadblock and going nowhere. But the promise of God in Psalm 37, the steps of the godly man and woman, (laughs) ordered by the Lord, though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast out. Why? Because the Lord upholds him with his own hand. Job may have felt 
like a building that's being destroyed or a tree being uprooted. But 2 Corinthians 4.16 promises, though our outward man perishes, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. Hallelujah. Job may have felt that God was encamping enemy. And it is far from being his enemy. God is his friend, but he felt that way. Oh, yes, we were at enmity with Christ before we came to him. We were enemies because our sin made us enemies of God. But now on the cross of Calvary, he destroyed that enmity, and he brought us to himself. Glory to God. Glory to God. My precious friends, do not go by your feelings. Let me repeat this. Do not go by your feelings. You will make the same mistakes that Job made. Don't go by your feelings. Your feelings may make you think that you're trapped in a net. It make you feel that you're standing condemned in a court of law and judged or standing still with a roadblock, or a being dethroned, or like a building that's being destroyed, or like a tree that's being uprooted, or God is your enemy, and that He's working against you. No in a million knows. When Jesus is your Savior and Lord, He comes in, and He enters into the power of His Holy Spirit, and He controls in your life, and if you hand over the hands of control to Him, He will take the reins. And he gives you victory instead of defeat. Yes. He is praying for you and interceding for you even now at this very moment with his Father in heaven. He will enable you to do all that he wants you to do. Yes. Listen to me. Some of you might be feeling lonely and experiencing the loneliness of suffering. Please understand. You understand that now, today, you can shout with the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 18, for I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. Amen. Job hoped to see his Redeemer. Well, we do. We do. We have. We have a Redeemer, a Savior, and a friend. Yes. You want to praise God? Amen. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Father, we know that your word will not return to you void. This is your word that has been proclaimed. And I know that the Holy Spirit who authored it is taking it right now and penetrating hearts and minds and bringing it to bear in the lives of many. Father, I'm so grateful that you know everything, yes. and you know everything about us, <laughs> and the amazing thing is you still love us. Yes. Lord, we praise you today. You. And Father, for that person who has not confessed, and that unconfessed sin caused them deep inner pain and loneliness, I pray that today be the day of deliverance. For that person who's suffering and experienced the loneliness of suffering, I pray deliverance. For I pray all of that in the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said amen. amen.